Hello, brothers. I'm so glad that I'm able to offer this reflection on spiritual practice. I wish we could be together in New Mexico for the solar eyes, but thank God for this virtual space that we have to, uh, to come together. I want to begin by a land acclamation. This land on which I live is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenape people. I pay respect to Lenape people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape dysphoria. I'm going to be using my teaching blanket for this segment on spiritual practice with some caution of cultural appropriation. I hope to use it um, in deep respect for the indigenous uh, traditions from which this medicine wheel uh, emerged. One time I was in a First Nations festival in uh, Canada and they had this image um, on the floor of the gathering and I went to one of the elders and I, I told her about my teaching. And I humbly asked for permission to use it in this kind of teaching and she said as long as you sort of honor the tradition and respect the origins uh, you can touch into the perennial wisdom that runs underneath all indigenous uh, wisdom so i do so with that posture this is not a drill for such a time as this we are called to step in to our world, our context, to make a difference. The heart of the matter. COVID-19, income inequality, racism, food, fuel, water shortages, resource scarcity, climate, climate chaos, mass poverty, mass migration, fundamentalism of all brands, terrorism, the list is long. We brothers have entered an age of disruption. This is a liminal time in which we're living, a time between stories. So the possibility of profound transformation, personally, materially, relationally, societally, systemically, and environmentally is real and possible. Now is our time. This moment of disruption that we all know that we're living with deals with death and rebirth. What's dying is the story of separation with the autonomous me at the center and the so-called other, including our most essential beloved selves, are cast to the margins. The story of separation is a story that collectively creates results that nobody wants. So brothers, we are called to lean into what's being born to a kingdom of love and justice. And we can feel this in our bones. The future is not just about uh, firefighting or tinkering with surface of structural change. We want to lean into transformation, into kind of an evolution of consciousness, uh, not uh, technical tweaks, but adaptive changes that can really make a difference in our world as we lean into the kingdom of love and justice. So it's a future that requires that we tap into a deeper level of our humanity, of who we really are and who we long to be. Think of Bill Plotkin's definition of a nurturing, generative adult. That's, that's who we're called to be in this time of death and rebirth. This is a future that we can sense and feel and actualize by deepening our spiritual practice. One teacher puts it this way, leaning into these times that we're living through without a deepening spiritual practice is like going into a forest fire 
wearing a paper toga. Brothers, this is not a drill. I want to begin by a prayer from Thomas Merton that resonates with me. I've been revisiting this prayer. Perhaps you're familiar with Merton's prayer when he writes and prays. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all I am doing. I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it, brothers. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never, never leave me to face my perils. So in this uh, little teaching that I want to do, I'm not going to give you a long list of spiritual practices. Um, I invite you to Google spiritual practices, especially you might search the tree of contemplative practices. It's a beautiful image that uh, is rooted and grounded in connection and love and has branches of various spiritual practices that you can explore. But I want to begin with, with a story of a particular transformation that happened in my own life. I, I grew up in a very conservative, uh, Pentecostal, really fundamentalist tradition. That, so my, my formative years were, were narrowly confined within a particular pretty constricted worldview. One example of that uh, worldview, that very kind of narrow exclusivity was um, you know, LGBTQ, um, realities were not even on our radar. It's not something we talked about or explored or as a child I, or, or even a young, young uh, going into my adolescence didn't even know it existed. And then of course I, I began to grow and as I moved out into the world I began to know some people who were gay. And so through those kind of a relational encounters I began to question my worldview um, and the dogma that constrained my view of the other. Well, that journey continued through my seminary training. I actually started seminary. I was initially an Assembly of God minister and still kind of moving through that kind of small story of separation. And I knew it was just too small for my soul's longing. So eventually I left that uh, denomination to become a Presbyterian minister and still you know, there's so much framed even within that tradition with kind of dogmatic legislation, particularly around issues of ordination and gay marriage. And so the last church that I was a pastor for 18 years was a journey of struggle, uh, really kind of <laughs> some blood, sweat and tears over this so-called issue. So about 10 years into my 18 year tenure at that church, um, you know, I had moved from that confining perspective to a very open and inclusive perspective, knowing that all people are loved and sexual orientation is not a choice, but it's uh, the way God has created people. You know, I, I have good friends who are, who are gay. But anyway, about 10 years into my tenure at that church, my son, who was about 14 at that uh, time, uh, came out and announced to us he was gay. And um, my wife's a psychologist, so, you know, I'm a you know, Presbyterian minister. I, we're pretty aware of people, but we had no idea that our son was gay until he announced to us one Friday evening. And it kind of shook our worlds and, and really, in a way, broke my heart. There was some grief that I experienced. And I remembered what Parker Palmer wrote in his book, Healing the Heart of Democracy. He, he said, you know, life will break your heart. That's what it means to be human our hearts get broken. Whether our hearts are bro or shattered into cynicism and judgment and you know, 
constriction and you know throwing hand grenades at the other he says or broken open to love depends on how our hearts are exercised over time so i'm driving to church that sunday morning after my son came out as gay knowing that you know the church would be aware of this by now he came out on facebook and it's a pretty good sized church and so i'm sure the word had spread and, you know there's still people in the congregation who are just really struggling with this uh, so-called issue so I'm driving to church that morning I remember going around this corner a particular place in my community driving and God I had this like epiphany and it just hit me that practice spiritual practice prayer is exercising the heart for the next next time the heart is broken so we can respond to the challenge or the brokenness or the invitation with a spirit of compassion and not reactivity. And so that's the heart of the matter that I want to try to unfold in our time together today. And it all begins with a question. The question is, what is the story I'm living inside? And is it too small for my soul's longing? And if you pause with that question long enough, the answer is going to be yes. <laughs> because whatever story we find ourselves li living in, we live against an infinite horizon of possibility and in this ocean of love. And just being human is going to give us a frame that is probably too small for our soul's longing. So when I think of our teaching blanket here, I put some soil in this first part. This is the story that we live in. And this is the ground kind of of our being, the soil of our story. And so the first uh, you know, movement on the journey that we're going to walk through this morning is getting in touch with our story. I read just this past week, I read and also listened to the audiobook of uh, John O'Donohue's uh, book, Beauty. And I wanna just uh, read an excerpt from that book because it really grounds us in this place of, of story. Donahue writes, the human mind is in itself a world with huge mountains, deep valleys and forests of the unknown. Given the private depths, deep strangeness and wonders of our interior life, it is amazing that we can reach out towards the world and to each other with such intimacy and understanding. He goes on, more amazing still is our ability to make everything so familiar and normal that we actually succeed in forgetting how strange and wondrous it is to be here. John O'Donoghue quotes the poet Rilke who said, being here is so much. We turn the mystery and strangeness of this world into our own private territory. Life becomes predictable and we function automatically within our frames. That's the story. The, the constricting story of separation. Route to work, colleagues, friends, patterns of thinking and feeling, the faces of family, etc. Without sensing it, we become lost inside the automatic traffic of function. Tara Brock, the Buddhist teacher, talks about living inside a trance. That's the story. Donahue continues, it is only when something goes wrong that we are hauled back to the edge. Quite abruptly, the familiar map has melted and territories that were sure ground an hour ago don't exist anymore. Doesn't that uh, describe the current state of our world? These structures that we thought would keep us safe are just unraveling before our very eyes. Quite abruptly, the familiar map has melted and territories that were sure ground an hour ago don't exist anymore. Heidegger said that it is only when a hammer does not work that you suddenly realize that it's a hammer. One more paragraph from Donahue. It is tragic that something has to go wrong before we can realize the gift of the world in our lives. Gifts that we could never have dreamed of or earned. When something goes deeply wrong, and a lot's going wrong, brother, 
When something goes deeply wrong, the realization it forces in, is inevitably learned at the grave of loss. What are we losing? What are we called to let go of so we can begin to move on this journey of transformation? If we were able to live in a deeper state of awareness and wisdom, and that's what spiritual practice is about, living in a deeper state of awareness and wisdom, our days on earth would find new frequency. Spaces would open naturally for beauty to touch us. And we need beauty as deeply as we need love. Beauty, and I'm going to think of that uh, synonymously as divine presence. You know, what is God other than beauty, right, and love? Beauty, Donahue writes, is not an extra luxury, an accidental experience that we happen to have if we're lucky. Beauty dwells at the heart of life. If we can free ourselves from robot-like habits of predictability, that's the story, robot-like habits of predictability, repetition and function, we begin to walk differently on the earth. We come to dwell more in the truth of beauty, the truth of God, the truth of our beloved identity as children of God. Ontologically, beauty is the secret sound of the deepest thereness of things. To recognize and celebrate beauty is to recognize the ultimate sacredness of experience. To glimpse the subtle embrace of belonging, brothers, where we wed to the divine, the beauty of every moment, of everything. John O'Donoghue. So, you know, we live in a time where there's like uh, the literal and metaphorical collective cry, I can't breathe, from the constricting choke of systemic racism to the effects of climate change and the fires that are burning around the world to economic insecurity, the list is long, that seems to kind of choke our soul and practice, spiritual practice, is a sort of flashlight that we can intentionally shine on our inner world that cuts through the fog and the smoke and the darkness and the numbingness. I once read that the success of any intervention, and this is our call, brothers, to be interveners in this time of chaos, to be conduits and channels of love. The success of any intervention is dependent upon the interior state of the intervener. And that's what spiritual practice is. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, that we may be strengthened in our inner being to be able to know the height and breadth and depth of, of God's love that surpasses no I've been sitting with uh, the text in John 15, actually when I was on my rites of passage and spending time in, in my circle, you know, out in the wilderness, the day alone in the wilderness. The text of John 15 kept coming to me where Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, so this uh, spiritual practice, what we're called to do is, is practice abiding in God, abiding in the vine so we can draw nourishment and strength, curiosity, compassion, and courage from the flow of that vine. So I was in my own spiritual direction um, and I'm going to do another video, actually, about spiritual direction. Just a couple weeks ago, I was in my own spiritual direction, and we were, you know, reflecting on this abiding, this energy of abiding. And you know, I, I felt it, I felt it deeply. Um, we, we dropped down to this uh, kind of ineffable sense of God's presence that 
becomes familiar territory in, in spiritual direction. That's the essence of, of being kind of in, in that companionship with that anamkara, that soul friend that can help guide one into that felt experience of the divine. And we were touching there and kind of uh, thinking and feeling and experiencing the essence of abiding. So we stayed there for a while in that kind of beautiful ocean of love. And then as we inevitably do, we begin to come out of that and kind of look at it, romance it, to speak of it. And so I kind of uh, said uh, to my spiritual director and to God who was present in that conversation, how do I know, you know, when I'm not abiding? How do I know when, I, I, when I'm not abiding in the vine? And it was like God said to me, you know, air quotes, of course, God said to me, it's not complicated, Terry. You know when you're stuck in a story that constricts your soul's longing. You can feel it with the anxiety, the disruption, the constriction of heart. And it was like the voice said, just come back. <laughs> just come back, stay connected. And so one spiritual practice that can help us stand back from kind of the trance where this kind of functioning in the in the story of separation is called the prayer of examen or the examination of conscience. This is the practice uh, taught mostly by Ignatius of Loyola, the Ignatian tradition, where at the end of the peri a period of time, a day, a week, any kind of period of time, in a prayerful way you kind of pause and you look over that period of time and you ask for grace to be able to see when during that day uh, did you feel a sense of consolation? And Ignatius describes that of, of uh, you know, the sense of openness and rightness, that kind of closeness to the divine, a sense of rest um, and peace in your heart. That those, those feelings, those experiences that draw us closer to God and to each other, really. And then offer gratitude for that and notice that, kind of romance those things. Ignatius talks about banking those consolations and put them in your memory, journal them. So the next time you face the other movement, which is desolation, you can draw from that bank or that well and remember how close God is, how with, with you all the time. And then notice also the times of desolation when you felt that constriction or anxiety or those movements kind of away from the God. And then ask for help. For guidance. So that kind of prayer of the examination or conscience or examine is one kind of prayer that can help us be aware of the story that we're living in, kind of to see, is it too small? And then the next step, I'm going to just kind of point to this uh, threshold right here. I call it the threshold of blessing. So some invitation penetrates our story. Something happens in our lives. It seems that God wants to get our attention to just open us up to God's infinite love and grace. And um, things happen you know, in our lives that, you know, I think of that Leonard Cohen uh, song anthem, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So inevitably, some invitation will come and penetrate our story. And so notice those, notice those catalysts, those windows of opportunity, those moments that are pregnant with transformational potential, both large and small. Uh, you know, one time when my children were very young, um, it was late at night, I remember it was a Tuesday night, uh, my, my spouse was a psychologist who was working late at night and I had worked all day and you know I was tired and I think my daughter was about uh, three and a half or so and my son was just like a uh, and they wouldn't you know they just wouldn't go to bed they were just wired and I was wired too <laughs> and I kind of just lost it you know and I, I just yelled out you guys go to bed I can't take this anymore and my three-year-old daughter, three and a half, girl, looked up at me and said, you know, Daddy, you don't like kids. <laughs> and so that was a, 
of this kind of mini crisis and invitation that penetrated the chronological quagmire that was, I was stuck in to open me up to the possibility of letting go. And so I took her by the hand and took my son in my arms. We went into the nursery and sat in the rocking chair with Nathaniel in my arms and Mackenzie, my daughter, at, at my side. We just kind of stayed there. So we moved because of that invitation from, again, the, the chronological chaos into a kairos, this, this time, sense of time that is pregnant with opportunity. And maybe even together we touched into that third kind of time, eternity or aeon. We sat there for I don't know how long. But just an example, you know, it's kind of a minor example of, you know, something that disrupts our story. Um, we have so many opportunities now to open up to something new. And so the, the question when there is a, an interruption, again, uh, will our hearts that are broken open be shattered into cynicism, etc., or will they be broken open to love? Depends on how they're exercised over time. So here it's the difference between reactivity to a disruption or response. So when there is a disruption, a diagnosis, a broken relationship, in the more systemic conflict, uh, all the political turmoil that's going on, who knows what we're leaning into, brothers. And so to exercise the heart through spiritual practice, so, you know, when there's a no, which is, of course, the hardwired natural reaction to a disruption, no, no to climate change, you know, to no to racism, no to uh, the, the diagnosis, to kind of soften that no and kind of lean into a more responsive yes. That's where we are on the journey and crossing this threshold of blessing. For in order to move from the story of separation into a larger field, we're going to explore this as the field of practice or the field of opening, we cross the threshold of blessing. Blessing. Here's where we come home to our, more, our most essential identity as beloved. The word blessing in the language of Christian scripture, um, the word blessing is makarios. You may recall the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus begins by saying, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So what they would have heard in this makarios is a, a deeper identity um, that cuts below the surface of poverty, be it spiritual or in Luke, uh, Luke and Beatitudes, it's actual physical poverty, but there's a deeper identity that Jesus, in giving a blessing, taps into, and that is uh, beloved child of God, the one to whom belongs the kingdom of God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, a blessing is the visible, perceptible, effective proximity of God. A blessing demands to be passed on. It communicates itself to other people. To be blessed is to be oneself a blessing. So the practice here at this threshold, this first liminal space, moving from a story that's just too small into a field of openness, is to practice blessing. To actually engage in putting your hand on your own heart and saying, you know, when you feel that constriction, where you feel that kind of sense of being lost on the way, ah, beloved child of God. And to find someone else, a friend, a spiritual director, an Anam Kara, a brother or sister, to actually put their hand on you to remind you of your most essential identity, beloved. For if we do not know that we are beloved, that we are blessed, that we are worthy of the journey, chances are we will find ourselves stuck in this story of separation, continuing in uh, what, I, what I believe is uh, contributing to a cycle of violence. But to know we are blessed gives us the courage to move into this kind of second movement. It's, it's the yellow here on the medicine wheel, this kind of metaphor. And that's the field of openness. And the symbol that I place there is water. So the symbol of the story is earth. The symbol of the field of openness is water. Because here is where 
we plant the seeds of our story and begin to, through practice, begin to open those up and cultivate that field and begin to water the field. And there are three kind of movements within this that we can apply our spiritual practice. Remember, awareness, awareness, awareness too. And the first is, as we move into the field of practice and openness, is to open the mind, to open the mind. You know, uh, in, in our Christian tradition, we hear a lot about the word repentance. Well, again, the Greek word, and I don't pretend to be a Greek scholar, but I know a few things. For repentance is metanoia, metanoia, which literally means opening the mind or moving into a bigger mind. And so for the first movement in this practice field, the field of openness, is going from this posture where all we see is what we project on the lens of our own reality to this, you know, opening up our mind, letting new information in. So a spiritual practice that you can engage with is opening up the mind is engaging in conversation with people who have different perspectives. And it's not hard to find these days. So to practice curiosity, suspending judgment, being open to letting something new in, doesn't mean you have to let go of everything you sort of believe or feel is true, but you hold it lightly in order to be engaged with letting something new in spiritual reading, you know, going to the edge of your knowing, standing back, we call it beginner's mind, uh, suspending judgment and engaging in the spiritual practice of curiosity. That's the first movement of the, this field of openness. And as we go deeper, remember always that we are blessed and beloved. And so we can risk, you know, moving into this, this field of openness. We begin to open up our hearts. So if we open up our mind, the next step is opening up our hearts. So the posture would be going from like this, to this, to this. Here we uh, the, begin to listen to the wisdom of the body. Uh, our, our physical incarnation because the body is the gateway to the heart. And so the spiritual practices that can really help our hearts to be open are practices that engage our bodies. You know, to engage not only our minds, practicing opening up our minds, letting new information in, but here we're attending to a kind of deeper gateway, the gateway of the body, which is the gateway to the heart. So attuning to the energy of our body and nature. That's why I wanted to come outside today to do this talk, you know, so we can uh, engage in that second brain, that second place of knowing the heart and the body. And here we are applying compassion versus cynicism. Here we begin to notice all those feelings that could be described as constricting feelings that constrict the flow of compassion through our very bodies. We can breathe into a sense of openness in our body. Some practices that really are, I think, helpful here, walking the labyrinth, taking walks in nature. I had a, yesterday a long kind of five mile walk in the woods and I began with kind of just a sense of anxiety and sadness, you know, kind of a little bit of overwhelm. And as I walked, I just found my heart beginning to open. So we began to open up the mind, open up the heart. And the third kind of general movement in this field of practice is opening up our will. Um, this is where we, uh, we recognize all the fear that is in the atmosphere and in our own lives and begin, instead of uh, letting fear be a roadblock, a paralyzing uh, block or wall on our path, we actually have the courage, which of course is a heart word, to lean in, to lean into the fear. I know that when I actually face fear and don't numb out, which can be a habitual way of moving back to the story of separation, I find that I become less fearful.
people are walking around today with so much fear. And so what are the practices that can help us to lean into fear? You know, it's like noticing, you know, instead of fight or flight or freeze, which is our hardwired tendency when faced with fear, it's kind of a survival mechanism. Instead, we attend and befriend that fear. Attending to our breath, slowing down, acknowledging. Uh, you know, Tara Brock, the, the Buddhist teacher, has a great uh, tool, practice for this place on the journey when faced with fear. And she has an acronym, uh, RAIN, R-A-I-N. R stands for just recognize what's there. It is what it is. Recognize it, don't push it away or grasp onto it too firmly. Recognize and A stands for allow it to be there. You know, don't be defined by it, just allow it to be there. I stands for um, inquiry. You know, this is not analysis just kind of have a sense of curiosity. Is this fear rooted in reality? Is it, is it really a threat that I need to, to react to? Or is there a way that I can lean into it and find a more compassionate response? So R is recognize, A is allow, I is inquiry, and N stands for non-identification or returning to kind of a natural state. You are not defined by this fear. You are not defined by any circumstances. This is an opportunity to go back to the first threshold, the threshold of blessing. And remember, we are blessed. So those are some practices. And then we face this second threshold right here. So what is, what is practice for? What do we, why do we do these spiritual practices? <laughs> this is the hard part. This is the path of descent. And really what we're practicing for is to die. I want to turn to our brother Weaver, Belden Lane, for a description I think that is helpful at this place on the path where he describes impasse. This is the threshold of impasse. You know, our, you know we do our best to practice, you know, to, to exercise our hearts for the next time it's broken. And the tendency is when we move through this field, to go here, this is, as you're going to see, is the field of co-creation. And we want to go from here to here to put into practice what we've learned, but there's yet another step. And it's a step of absolute surrender into the divine because we face an impasse. And here's what Belden says about impasse. In a genuine impasse, one's accustomed way of acting and living is brought to a standstill. The left side of the brain, with its usual application of linear, analytical, conventional thinking, is ground to a halt. The impasse forces us to start all over again. It drives us to contemplation. On the other hand, the impasse provides a challenge and a concrete focus for our contemplation. It forces the right side of the brain into gear, seeking intuitive, symbolic, unconventional answers so that action can be renewed eventually with greater purpose. And so this is when the seeds that we've planted in the field of openness in our practice begin to crack open. And so the symbol that I place in this, this red quadrant is the uh, symbol for the sacred is fire. Here is where kind of the al alchemical transformation really takes place when we die into God. So the best words that I can use to describe this experience and practice is the practice of leaning into divine empathy. So imagine three concentric circles. And the first circle would be kind of just moving through our everyday life in kind of the trance, you know, we just go from, from moment to moment to moment in, uh, along this linear path, this chronos. 
and then we enter the field of opening, that would be kind of the second circle where we begin to take the backward step, you know, to see where our minds are constricted. We open up our hearts to practicing and then begin to let go with courage, uh, meaning into fear. That's all great. You know, those are really necessary practices. But there's one more circle. You know, there's that inner circle of moving through our story, the second circle of practice, and then the third circle that happens in our lives. Um, and I am going to call that divine empathy, where we just know that we know that we know that we're loved. When I was in the middle of my, my seminary experience, I went through a divorce and it was devastating. It just really rocked my world. Uh, it shook me to the core and I, I went to a therapist uh, who was actually a professor at the seminary as well. And he said, you know, um, I'd like to invite you to read a sermon by Paul Tillich. Paul Tillich is a systematic theologian uh, taught at Union, Union Seminary in New York. And he has a collection of sermons called Shaking, Shaking the Foundations. And there's one sermon in that collection called You Are Accepted. And so I went, you know, found that book in a used bookstore and, and found that sermon and, and read this. And I want to read it to you because this is kind of what happens in this third space of divine radical empathy, knowing that we know that we know we are loved. Here's what Tillich writes. We cannot transform our lives unless we allow them to be transformed by that stroke of grace. It happens or it does not happen. And certainly it does not happen if we try to force it upon ourselves, just as it shall not happen so long as we think in our self-complacency, we have no need of it. Grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. Think impasse. It strikes us when we walk through the dark valley of a meaningless and empty life. It strikes us when we feel that our separation is deeper than usual because we have violated another life, a life which we loved or from which we were estranged. It strikes us when our disgust for our own being, our indifference, our weakness, our hostility, and our lack of direction and composure have become intolerable to us. That's a beautiful kind of definition of impasse. It strikes us when year after year, the longed for perfection of life does not appear. When the old compulsions reign within us as they have for decades, when despair destroys all joy and courage, Sometimes at that moment, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is as though a voice were saying, you are accepted, you are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you, and the name of which you do not know. Do not ask for that name now, perhaps you will uh, find it later. Do not try to do anything now, perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything, do not perform anything, do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. After such an experience, we may not be better than before, and we may not believe more than before, but everything is transformed. In that moment, grace conquers sin, and reconciliation bridges the gulf of estrangement, and nothing is demanded of this experience, no religious or moral or intellectual presupposition, nothing but acceptance. And so here, brothers, in this alchemical encounter with the felt presence of the holy, we dwell in this kind of third circle of divine empathy. You know, for me, the most powerful experience of God that I've ever had was one time in a liturgical setting. It was in my training for becoming a spiritual direction. It was kind of the last worship service that we had as a cohort, and we were uh, sharing the sacrament. And I had, you know, all I can describe as a vision or kind of a deep imaginative sense of God's presence. And I had this picture of me with my head on Jesus' lap and Jesus kind of just stroking my ear like a beloved parent 
within the heart of God, calm and quiet is my soul, like a little child resting in his father's arms. That's what happens there, brothers. That's what happens there. And then, you know, we're, we're not called to hold on to this. This ecstasis or ecstatic, which means to stand outside oneself totally and be held in the divine radical empathy of the embrace of God is in itself complete and paradoxically also has a propelling force to it that moves us into the world. And so the third threshold that we encounter on this path is the threshold that we're going to name as inconsummation. That means coming to befriend the incompleteness of our human experience. And when we move from this ecstatic experience of divine embrace into our context, the field of co-creation, the experience of God is going to feel somewhat incomplete. It's just the nature of being human. I think this is kind of the inner tidal zone between contemplation and action. One of my favorite sayings is the, from the Jewish mystic Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was writing about Sabbath when he said, in the tumultuous ocean of time and toil, there are islands of stillness where when we enter their harbors, we reclaim our dignity. Right? So we're in that kind of uh, Kairos place. And we begin to move back into the chronological sense of our context, our lives. We're kind of in this inner tidal zone of contemplation and action. I was once invited to do a talk at an urban church in Trenton, New Jersey on Good Friday. They invited me to come to this multicultural urban church to talk about the relationship between uh, contemplation and action. And they said, you know, you have like five minutes. I think it was, yeah, it was a Good Friday service where they're doing the seven last words of Jesus or something. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to do that. And here's what I said. If our practice, our spirituality is only about our growth, our self uh, transcendence, about seeing the story of me that we habitually inhabit, if that's all it's about, that it runs the risk of cutting us loose from that story so that we no longer take care of the human wounds uh, of self and other. We can become ungrounded. We may become dependent on feelings of ecstasy as a means of escape from the ongoing realities of our life, seeking to avoid the difficulty of being human. So here we are leaning toward the return to the messiness of life, Unless our spirituality, our work with grief, our contemplative practices contributes to action, it will regress into an insipid moralizing, or perhaps worse, a reactive fundamentalism that will only serve to cycle the fuel of reactivity and violence. And unless our action, our activism, is rooted and anchored in contemplation, opening us to love, it will likewise regress into another version of ineffective and arrogant dualistic fundamentalism, again, eventually contributing to the cycle of violence. So this is the movement here, brothers, toward the world, carrying the experience of love with us like a sword and a chalice. I have my flute here just to symbolize wind, you know, the, the wind that carries us from the soil of our story through the water that of, in the field of openness through the fire that cracks us open to the divine and the wind that generates movement into the world. The moment we choose to love, we begin to move against domination, against oppression. The moment we choose to love, we begin to move toward freedom, to act in ways that liberate ourselves and others. So brothers, we are called, and there's an urgency around this, we are called to create and nurture holding places so people can remember their essential identity as beloved and live into their purpose. 
Christian Wyman is um, a poet. He's actually a professor at Yale Divinity School, and he uh, suffered very, very difficult cancer, almost died, very painful. He wrote a book called My Bright Abyss, My Bright Abyss. Let me quote from this. This is a beautiful description of this movement from silence into action, from the contemplative into the field of co-creation. Wyman writes, silence, which opens the human heart to love is the language of faith. Action, be it church or charity, politics or poetry is the translation. As with any translation, action is a mere echo of its original, inevitably faded and distorted, especially as it moves further from its source. There the comparison ends though, for while it is true that action degrades the original silence. That's the feeling. You know, when we move from that ecstasy into uh, the creative field, bringing the balm and gifts into the world, you know, we feel the, the experience of God feels diffuse. We may even question, did it, did it really happen? But yes, it's the natural movement. Wyman continues, for while it is true that action degrades that original silence and your moments of meditative, meditative communion with God can seem a world away from the chaotic human encounters to which those movements compel you. It is also true that without these constant translations into action, that original sustaining silence begins to be less powerful and then less accessible and then finally impossible. So we need to find a way to move into that opening. And when we cross this threshold of inconsummation or incompleteness and begin to make friends with it, uh, you know, Karl Rahner, the German theologian, I, I think, you know, said, said it best when he said, it is in the tumult, no, Karl Rahner said, it is in the torment of the insufficiency of everything attainable in this life, we come to realize all symphonies remain unfinished. Let me say that again. It is in the torment of the insufficiency of everything attainable in this life. We come to realize all symphonies remain unfinished. So it's like making friends with the inconsummate nature of the human journey. So we don't try to cling on to that uh, uh, you know, essential feeling of God's presence, but we follow the thread of it into our world. And then we discern. The, the spiritual practice of discernment I think might be captured best by Fred Beekner, the Presbyterian minister, where, he, where uh, Fred wrote, where our deepest gladness and the world's deepest hunger meet, we hear our further call. So we begin to, to lean into our purposeful expression of our uh, growth and evolution and experience, our purposeful expression, which leads to kind of our destiny. And we don't need to know precisely what's happening here, exactly where it's all going to go. What we need is to recognize the possibilities and challenges that are offered in our context right now, in the present moment, and to embrace them with a sense of, remember, worthiness, curiosity, compassion, and courage, a felt experience of God. We carry that into the world. Two uh, quick sayings of Jesus from the Gospel of Thomas guide us here. The Gospel of Thomas, Logion 7, Yeshua said, Blessed is the lion devoured by a human, for that lion becomes human. Cursed is the human devoured by a lion, for that human becomes lion. You know, you're going to have to sit with that a little bit. Check it out. So we've begun to integrate in our practice field the, the fire in our bellies so it doesn't burn us or burn those we love. We have integrated that lion there, that eros, that divine energy in our lives so we're able to really carry it like a balm into the world. And then in Logion 8, uh, you know, so that was Logion 7 saying 7, Logion 8, Yeshua said, a human being is like a good fisherman who casts his net into the sea. When he pulls it out, he finds a multitude of little fish. Among them, there is one fine, large fish. 
without hesitation, he keeps it and throws all the small fish back into the sea. Those who have ears, let him hear. <laughs> so what a beautiful kind of description of the sermon. The question is, what is mine to do? What do I need to let go of? And what do I need to take hold of? What is mine to do? Father Thomas Keating said, the sermon is a process of letting go of what we are not. Letting go of what we are not. So here we need to trust our instincts to be guided by our spiritual intuition, our well-practiced open heart and mind. Sometimes there's uh, either uh, not enough evidence to go on or there are so many facts that the walls of reason cannot contain them. So we need to kind of slow down and really practice the sermon. There's so much to be said about the sermon. It's a whole other teaching. How do we sift through uh, the possibilities with our intention to do God's will that we can trust that the future we're moving into is God's will for us. And then we move into kind of this co-creative field, this, this uh, what Otto Scharmer calls rapid prototyping. I love what Rumi said, a night full of talking, a night full of talking that hurts, my worst held back secrets. Everything has to do with loving and not loving. The night will pass, then we have work to do. So brothers, you know, step into the emerging future, put into practice what you're called to do. You know, fail quickly, to learn quickly, take risks, go to the edge of your knowing. Barbara Holmes, who is on the faculty of uh, Center for Action and Contemplation, in her book, Joy Unspeakable, says, you know, how do we, the question is, how do we co-create where there's so much brokenness, so much resistance in the world? And Holmes writes, while your heart is broken with grief, while you can't breathe, you walk together, children. You stand in a sundress, unarmed and disarming, before jack-booted, militarized police troops. You trust that you are the art of the universe that bends toward justice. And with every breath you pray, you are the art of the universe that bends towards justice. And with every breath you pray. And finally, we return. We return because we live against an infinite horizon of possibilities. And there's always more. So we find ourselves back in a story, again, that is going to be too small. And we begin to practice. So this, this field is not kind of a flat, linear path that we move through, and that's the end of the story. We do make progress on the path. You know? It's more like a spiral. And you know what, what I have found is sometimes, you know, I may find myself here in a place of discernment. What is mine to do? And I begin to doubt, and I need to go back to this first threshold of worthiness, you know, to remember I am beloved, and then integrate all these practices. So I just wanted to offer this teaching. I, I hope that uh, you'll find some help, and you know, I, I'd love to be able to talk to you uh, more about this. If anybody wants to uh, talk to me or contact me, you can find me, my website is alliesonthejourney.com or you can reach me at terry at alliesonthejourney.com. Blessings, brother. It's great to be with you from this time.